and then I told her about the membership. So I don't think she's used it yet. But I hope she does. Yes. Well, I think what she tried is she did. Yeah. 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 She did years yeah. ago, and I don't know if it was an MLA in the area or something gave a donation of a hundred dollars because she said she had trouble trying to pay you know the drivers. Oh, and get she up, get up, up get pay. up in Jesus' name. The Lord is calling daily to those who would be saved. Don't go down defeated. Well, victory's here to claim. Get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. Well, at the gate called Beautiful, they laid out in the street. A poor and lonely beggar who was crippled in their feet. As John and Peter passed him, they saw that he was bad. They had no gold or silver, but they gave him what they had. Get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. The Lord is calling daily to those who would be saved. Don't go down defeated. Well, victory's here to claim. Get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. You rock that out. That's okay. Just crank that up. There you go. There you go. Okay to lose some of the body, right? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, in the days in which we live, there's evil everywhere. The body seems to scourge and overcome with fear. Well, God is needing soldiers, so get out of the pews and take hold of the power that John and Peter used. Get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. The Lord is calling daily to those who would be saved. Don't go down defeated. Well, victory's here to claim. Get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. Get up, get up. Get up in Jesus' name. The Lord is calling and even those who let me say, don't go down to feed it. Well, victory's here to claim. Get up, get up, get up in Jesus' name. Get up, get up in Jesus' name. The Lord is calling daily for those who would be uh, saved. And uh, it's uh, a lot of people sick today. We're going to be praying for a lot of people that are uh, sick in our community and among other things. And uh, over the next three, as I alluded in on Facebook, uh, over the next three weeks, we're going to be uh, starting a three-point sermon. We touched on it years ago. But there is a reason that people are hanging on um, or wanting to get out of the life that they live. There's a reason that people are living a certain life and they want to get out, but they don't know where to go and they don't know. So I, I, and then they want to go somewhere else, but they're not sure how to get there. And then our third message is going to be the people that are hanging on to both worlds with both hands, white knuckling, don't want to let go of either. And uh, Laosidia in the book of Revelation reminds me of that. If you want to take a peek at that, um, we don't like the lukewarm people, so make a decision, right? One or the other. Jesus says, Hey, if you mess up and you're bad, I can deal with that. If you're good, I can deal with that. But if you're sitting in the middle, vacillating, doing nothing, I, I you know, spit you out of my mouth. 
And it's a rather descriptive spit. It's more like a, a projectile and vomiting thing <laughs> happening there. So you don't really want that. I remember one day with our, our little one, with Tony, and uh, she was on my, you know, the bathroom was maybe five feet from the hallway into where the bathroom was, a little hall. And, and I thought she might throw up, and so I had her in front of me facing away, of course. Uh, because fathers make one mistake once, right? Oh! And mom's saying, you shouldn't be doing that. Oh! Uh, as a child pukes all over your face and down the front. So you stop doing that after a while. Anyways, I ran towards the bathroom, and she just went, burp! And it was just like a funnel of vomit. Smack! Hit the wall like that. And if you're thinking, when you're reading the book of Revelation, you're talking about Jesus throwing, spitting people out, throwing people out, that's what it's like. It's, it's a forceful, vomiting, horrible thing. You don't want that, so you want to be listening to this uh, third message. And the message is for uh, a lot of people. And it might be for you, it might be for people at home, it might be for people that you know. And if we're going to help them, or if they're going to help themselves, they need to find out why they're wanting to get out of the life that they're in. And we're going to, we're going to touch on that today. And uh, the hymn sing was great, had a great time. Thank you very much for those who came out to that. We're back in Bible study on Wednesday, hopefully if everyone's healthy enough. A lot of people have been sick. Uh, I went with um, with uh, uh, um, Pauline and, and Gerald uh, to the funeral home the other day, and uh, they're just having, they're not having a service or anything, they're having a burial in the spring, and I think I'm going to help them with that, uh, but we need to be praying for the Vickery family, for, for, uh, for Norman and Jerry Paul's family. And there was a ton of people there, so a lot of people affected by that. And uh, so uh, he's going to be cremated, and uh, I think some of them will be taken out to the wolves. He was a fisherman, of course. And uh, so I think most of them will be spread out in the wolves, and some will go on the ground somewhere, perhaps. I'm not sure. It's really not up to me. Uh, but let's keep them in, in our thoughts as well as some of the other people out there. Uh, as I've told you before, uh, we're at a time of year where a lot of kids come into foster care because of Christmas and the pressures and the drugs and all the other things like that. And so we'll be in prayer for those. We're gonna start by singing uh, in, in just a second, Hosanna praise uh, is rising. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for each individual. I ask a blessing upon their lives, Lord. Uh, Father, May you make us attentive to your message today, that we might perhaps see even parts of ourselves in that. That we can see others that we love and care about in that, Lord, that we might help them as well. Father, we want to glorify you with all that we say and all that we do. And so be with us and guide us through this service. Incline your ear, hear our music, our song, hear our prayers and our, our petitions and our requests. Hear our sorrow, but hear our joys as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Brad, you stand here trying to get used to the other one, just sort of self imploded somehow. I don't know how, but uh, these things happen, right? Courage is rising, eyes are turned.
winter that we've had and that we're probably going to get a lot more of that before it's over. A lot of people are going to get sick. Um, they say that COVID, as I said earlier, my daughter's boss, a surgeon, had to run home and take care of his, or to see his mother who was in the hospital because of RSV, which I thought was for children. And so it's not. And so there's RSV out there, there's COVID out there, there's a regular flu out there, there's a head cold rolling around. There's so much more that can make you sick, and so we need to be uh, very careful. And I think, I believe, that, that wonderful things are going to happen here at Beaver Harbor uh, Baptist in, in our community. And, uh, and so we just need to be behind that, to be praying for that. And what is Christian hope? Christian hope is not, I hope this will happen, or I hope someone will come by, or hope, right? Christian hope is a hope of something that's already happening or already happened. That's what Christian hope is. And I believe God is going to do powerful things in our community. And that's the kind of hope I have, that it's going to happen. We have started in the past, we wanted to have 50 people here. That was our vision, that was our goal. And I believe we're going to attain that this year or shortly after that. And, uh, and uh, God is mighty and can work in our community. And when you hear about some of the things that we're going to talk about today, about why people want to get out of their lives and, and why they want to get into something, but they don't know what that is or why they might be hanging on to both, it'll make some sense to you. We're going to sing this beautiful song that leads into prayer today. Um, it is well with my soul.
and our requests, Lord. We lift our sorrows and our pains, but we also lift our joy and our happiness and our contentment. For you indeed are the God of all that we see and hear and taste and touch, smell and feel and experience, Lord. We praise you and love you for that. Lord, I, I pray for the little children in our communities that maybe not doing so well because of their parents, because of finances, because of addictions, Lord, because of so many other things. And so, Father, be with those children. Be with the teachers who are their parents, Father, for a great deal of their lives in the run of the year. I want to pray for the strength and boldness and the compassion that teachers have, strength and knowledge. Father, I want to pray for our community that as we move into this new year, that they would see that, they, that, that where they want to get out of, the things that they want to do away with, that there's a place that they can go to, there's a place that they can rest, there's a place that they can have their, answer, their questions answered, there's a place where they can get love, Lord. And that would be right here. And so I invite them to explore this place, to come in, and to feel the love and to be part of a family and to be part of people who care, Lord. They have big dreams this year, big visions, big desires, Lord, not only in this community, but in Sri Lanka as well, as we continue to help with the poor and unfortunate there. Father, help us, a small church on a hill in a small village, to be an amazing influence an amazing testimony to you, Father, in the world around us. So, Father, be with each and every one of us as we explore this message today. Father, be 
a voice into their hearts. Father, be with the family of be with Pauline and Gerald today and, and all of their families they deal with the loss of her brother. Be with those that we're losing each and every year by these horrible diseases that are out there. Help us, Father, to protect ourselves and to protect those that we love. Father, lead us now in this message. Precious name of Yeshua. Amen. So again, I'll be bringing a three-part message over the weeks to come. The first called Getting Out. The second called Getting In. And the third called The Great In-Between that many people find their, themselves in. Now, before we get started, there are some things that we need to understand. Uh, the first one comes from our neighbors to the south with some statistics. It reads this way, 176 million Americans claim to be Christians. That's 69% of the population. Yet only 6% of adults identify as Christians that possess a worldview Believe in the Bible and that it's accurate and reliable, among other convictions. And that's according to a study by George Barna and some other people. The study asserts that every person has a worldview. And what is a worldview? A worldview is defined as intellectual, emotional, and spiritual decision-making filter. That you see the world around you in a different way. That you would see the world around you through the eyes of Jesus. Now I want to give you a, a, just a glimpse of a, how unbelievably how a great deal of our planet lives. I've been to slums and poor places in South America and in Asia and in Africa and other places. The last place I was was Tema. And I want to show you some pictures. I love kids. Kids love me because I'm a fool, right? I, I act like that. And so, yeah, okay, go, go ahead. And, uh, yeah, it's just fun. Now, stop here. When I was baptizing from that particular village, this is where it was done. This is not a baptismal font. This is not the ocean. I didn't want to step in there. Up the stream, they put the stakes in to keep the, uh, the uh, alligators away, the crocodiles away, sorry, right? So we could do that without getting eaten. Go ahead. And there I am down there preparing, thinking, Lord, don't let me die. Here is uh, the neighborhood that we were in. Go ahead. These are just some of the pictures from the slums in, in a place called Teba near Accra in the, the West African country of Ghana. Go ahead. How would you like your kids to play in this? Because that's where you play outdoors, right? Go ahead. You have cabs even there, right? Little stands. Not Probably not lemonade. I don't know what's there. Go ahead. This is the school. People worry about some of the schools aren't shiny enough. How about this kind of school? There's more of the neighborhood. Keep going, please. Uh, in between some houses that we walk. This is a bedroom for three people and their storage closet. Go ahead. Uh, storage stuff, everything. They jam in there. This is the kitchen, but they cook outdoors. There's no room inside. Uh, whatever yummy thing that is. <laughs> When I was in Africa, I, I, I never went behind the hut to see what they were cooking. You just ate it, right? Uh, there's a nice lunch getting ready for you. Uh, some more play fields for kids out the back. Keep going. Keep going. And uh, everything in Ghana, of course, is everything's Jesus Christ or my Lord or this or that more. Uh, down the street. And uh, stop there for a second. This street, the the... It's for the, the rainy season runoffs. But I, as I was walking up the street, a young lady walked over the side, stepped on both sides of it, squatted, and had a little pee. And, and I'm guessing that's not the first time. Yeah, go ahead. One more. Uh, I just wanted to give you an idea. A little store back there, right? And this is from above, looking down. It's down in the ocean, all these... 
catacombs of shacks and stuff like that. And the reason I showed you this is, you know, you can see pictures. There's no doubt about that, right? You can see little videos of poor people. But in, unless you're there, I could taste it. I could smell it. I could feel it. Uh, I, you know, I twisted an ankle on some of the rocks. I uh, had a little lunch with the family in that little, that little place where, you know, it was, it was not much bigger than the, the foyer of the church here, just outside the doors. It was really quite small. And, uh, and I've come to realize that a great deal of our planet lives this way. And if we want to have a spiritual perspective, if we want to have a worldview perspective on, on our lives, then we have to come to understand that how we live is not normal. It's great. I love it. I'm not complaining. But that most of the planet lives this way. And if you come to realize that most of the planet lives this way, believe it or not, it is true, then you might not complain so much about what you have here, right? This is Canada, this graph. You see here the spiritual, the non the spiritual unbelievers at the top keep rising, the non-believers uh, keep rising, the privately faithful are dropping, and religiously committed uh, are kind of dropping. A little bit of a bump there in the year 20 and 21, but now we're in 2022, 2023, things are going back. Uh, down again. Uh, when you see that the privately faithful, the reason they're going down is because they're privately faithful in their homes and there's no one to hold them accountable. Right? No one to tell them what they're doing is right or wrong. Iron sharpens iron. You've got to be in here. And if you're private, things are just going to continue to go down. So these people have a desire to get out of whatever they're into. And so I was looking online, I found an article on Forbes magazine, and it was about workplace, but the main headings I thought were very relevant for us today, and so I took the main headings from this Forbes thing, and I, I put in uh, something else. But, but the first thing is this, drift syndrome, drift syndrome. When we can't figure out what we're doing or why we're doing it, right? Or we do things we don't want to do. And that happens all the time. People are they're just drifting in their mind. They're vacillating back and forth. They can't make a decision. And the Apostle Paul, the same thing happened to the Apostle Paul, did it not? It's on the screen here. It's found in the book of Romans chapter 7 and verse 15 to 20. I love this of, of Paul. This, this is being real. This is being truthful. <laughs> This is being transparent. This is not being religious, which is pejorative these days. It's a bad word, right? But this is, this is not being that way. He says this. For what I am doing, I don't understand. For I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. But what if I do the very thing I don't want to do? I agree with the law, confessing the law is good, so now no longer... Am I the one doing it but sin which dwells in me? For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing is of good is not. For the good I want to do, I don't do. But the practice is very evil that I don't want to do. But even if I'm doing the very thing I don't want to do, I'm no longer the one doing it but sin that dwells within me. And there are people out there that they're just drifting about. They don't, they're not anchored anywhere, and they don't know the good that they're not doing or the bad that they are doing, and they're lost in that. And because of that, they might come to a realization that they want out from that. They want something much better. What about too busy for passion? What is your passion? Is it flying? Is it, that's mine right now. Is it flying? Is it reading? Is it art? Or drawing? Is it music? Is it the theater? What is your passion? But a lot of people are so busy with work that they can't slow down enough for passion. I've been in homes where 
the, the homes look like they're from Better Homes and Gardens magazine. I thought they were coming in to do a photo shoot, shoot at any time. If you come into our home, you're never going to see a picture of our home in Better Homes and Gardens. <laughs> our home looks lived in. Really lived in. Yeah. Even with the, yeah. Looks lived in. <laughs> it's lived in, but we find time for our passions. It's not dirty. It's a little uptight. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I was not supposed to Everything's clean. You know, oh, wow. I dug a hole 45 years ago. I'm still trying to climb out of it. The point I'm trying to make is that we can be caught up in the routine things of life and miss a passion, miss enjoying something, right? Miss enjoying our children, miss, enjo miss enjoying a, a film or art or, or getting out for a walk or nature. And we can't do that. Sometimes we can't locate a purpose. Now, Rick Warren, who's the pastor of Saddleback Church in California, wrote a book on uh, uh, the purpose-driven life. And when I first read it, I thought he just looked at every translation available, a hundred of them or so, found everywhere in every translation that said purpose and wrote a book. And uh, it was really bizarre. But when you really read it, he's got a point there. We all want to have a purpose for our lives. We all want to have a direction for our lives. And what he says is very, very true. He says, what you believe is how you behave and how you behave is what you become. So what do you believe? If you believe in a certain way, right, you will behave that way. And if you behave that way, you'll become that way. And so there are people out there that are believing and behaving and becoming. And they're saying, I don't like this. I want out. I want something better. I want to believe in something better so I can behave better so I become a better person. They want out. What about the social support is vacant? I know so many people that have no social life. I took my daughter to a breakfast when she was here. We went up to the ridge. We sat in the corner. We always do. And we watched people. And the majority of couples and people were, were that's, that they were just doing this. They were doing this. The food was coming. They were doing this. With a loved one or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or wife or husband, children all around them. And they're all doing this, right? They don't have a social support because they don't talk to each other. And when their devices die and they get into trouble, they don't know how to communicate with each other. They need someone to help them with that. What about a cognitive overload? What if we're spinning so many plates that we're just bombarded and overloaded and we don't know what to do? Because life says you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this, you have to do that. And you're spinning all these plates and people want out. They want to smash them to the ground. They want to stop spinning them. They want out of that kind of life into something else. What about... Distractions. I, I love my phone. It's recording the service right now. Whenever I go to a doctor's appointment or a dentist's appointment and they give me a new data, I say, just a second, I have to put it in my brain. Right. And I put it in my brain. All my contacts are in there. It's all protected by my face, I guess, my face ID or whatever. Um, but then I'm on the, the, the family thing, right? Where they talk all the time, all the people in the family. And sometimes I'm trying to, I sit there and, and it's beep, 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 beep. And so I put that on silent and it's bzz, bzz, bzz. Some days I just, and, and it's nice that we're communicating that way and talking and sharing information, but sometimes I just want to go to the front door and chuck that thing in the ditch. Right? Or turn it off. I can't turn it off because someone might try to get a hold of me. What about false expectations? Media representations create false expectations. Right? We're going to go right there number eight. Uh, 
The media tells you how you're supposed to look, what kind of car you're supposed to drive, what kind of house you're supposed to live in, what kind of food you're supposed to eat, what kind of friends you're supposed to have, so much more. It tells you these things. And a lot of people, and we try, we try to keep up with the Joneses, with the Twaddles, one. It was a lousy Christmas, worst one, never did it again. But we tried, we felt the pressure to, to, to provide what other people could provide, even though we could not. And people want out of that. They really do. Now, we invite people in here and we say, listen, I don't care what kind of education you had or did not have, what kind of car you do or do not drive, what kind of home you live in, how you talk. I, I don't care about those things. I just want you to come in and be part of our family. But there are people out there who care. That if I walk into their home with my jeans and my running shoes on, they look down at me. What are the expectations? We had a funeral here once. Danny was here, which was nice. Uh, we're sitting together. Danny was wearing this nice three-piece suit. I was wearing slacks, but a nice shirt, right? And, and uh, nice shoes or whatever. And someone in the back, I heard someone in the back say, hey, the pastor's up front there. And guess where the person went? To Danny. He's wearing a suit, right? It's a Baptist church. The Baptist church, Baptist pastors wear a suit, right? But I've already told you, right, in my past life, I was a crooked priest, and I was probably hung. And so whenever I try to put a, like, I can't do it like that, so I can't. I had one tie I had to wear once a year at work, maybe twice a year. I, it was tied for 27 years. <laughs> Same one. And then I had another one when I was in the Wesleyan world for about 20 years. And every year you had to go, right? They go to Beulah and there's ordination and all this other stuff. You had to wear a tie. And that was tied for 20 years. <laughs> it's probably still tied somewhere up in the closet. I don't know. I was sitting in the car when someone drove in. And they said, oh, yeah, but, uh, 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 you know, what are you here for? I said, well, I'm the pastor here. You don't look like a pastor. <laughs> well, what's a pastor supposed to look like? <laughs> Obviously not me. Right? What's a church supposed to look like? You're supposed to come in and be solemn, and the deacons at the back, the slack in the back of the head, if you smile, right? Is that the old-fashioned way of doing things? It's not done anymore, certainly not done here. This is definitely not your grandfather's or grandmother's Baptist church. But if we were to fall into what the world says should be, we'd all be here in our hats and our dresses and our suits and ties, and we'd be, we wouldn't smile, we wouldn't laugh, we wouldn't do anything, right? We'd all live in big houses we couldn't afford. A friend of mine, friends of ours lived in a big, huge house that was bought for them. It was a million-dollar house, right? They lived in a quarter of it. The rest of it was poor because they couldn't heat it, and they, what were they going to do with it all? Right? We didn't even want to go in. They invited us in. We pulled up in front of the house and we thought, <laughs> rich people didn't even want to go in the house. And so we found them huddled in one part of the house. They were normal like the rest of us. They just had, you know, a fancy house. People want out of that. They don't want to have to look like Twiggy. They don't have to look, you shouldn't be able to count all your ribs and be 50 pounds soaking wet. Right? To be a young lady and to wear the clothes that they would have for young ladies. People want out of that. They want into something else. And so, I want to sum up, really, why people are developing a conviction to get out of where they live. They're drifting through life. They have misplaced passions. They lack a defined purpose. They're lonely even around people. Even some are in a church and they're still lonely and they're surrounded by people that love them. They're mentally overloaded, distracted, in poor health. Uh, one of our children in Toronto, everything they order every day is Grubhub, Uber Eats, DoorDash, Skip the Dishes, is there anything else? Which is all garbage delivered to your door and it makes you unhealthy and they're unhealthy. Unmet expectations, lack, and there, even in church, are people that lack a hope, and they still consider their mortality every now and then. And they have a decided lack of worldview. They think that everyone 
like the people in the village or the community they live in lives that way. They do not. They do not. I showed you some pictures of that, the last storm I was in. I wouldn't want my kids playing around there. I, could, I just wouldn't want it. Because of the sins, we want out. They want out. We want out of our current lives. We want to seek a better life. We want to seek answers we don't have. We want to seek a direction. And so I ask, how do you get out? How do you get out? How do you break free? How do you s satisfy those things in life that are not currently working for you? You may say that you were there once and that you found a better way, that you got out. You may say that you have found a happiness that you've never had before. You may say that you found a purpose in your life that you've never found before. You may say that all is well. It's like I asked you when you're coming through, how are you today? Shields up, Scotty. I'm fine. With a little boy and a little girl behind the shields is crying. Right? I would say that there are probably 10% of those in Canada who call themselves Christians that don't have a worldview. They don't have that emotional and spiritual filter. Listen to these words from Proverbs. They won't be on the screen. The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish tears it down with her own hand. He who walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. In the mouth of the foolish is the rod for his back, but the lips of the wise will protest them. Where the walks and are the manager, the major is clean, but much revenue comes by the strength of the ox. A trustworthy witness will not lie, but a false witness utters lies. A scoffer seeks the wisdom and finds none. But knowledge is easy to one who has an understanding. Leave the presence of a fool, or you will not discern knowledge. The wisdom of sensible is to understand this way. But the foolish of fools is deceit. Fools mock at sin. But among the upright there is goodwill. The heart knows its own bitterness, and the stranger does not share its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. And here's the big thing. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end leads to death. We want out of our old nature. We want out of our old world. We want out of the problems that we have, and we want to go somewhere else. But there are too many of us that don't know how to get out. Or some of us are still in this place, and we don't quite realize it yet. Here is a rhetorical question for you. You don't have to answer the question. You don't have to make a noise at all. You just have to think in your mind and answer. Each and every one of you and those at home as well. Are you still drifting through life? Are you still dealing with misplaced passions? Do you still have a lack of defined purpose in your life? Are you still lonely, even surrounded by people who love you? Are you still struggling with mental overload? Are you still easily distracted? Are you still in poor health? Do you still have unmet expectations? And we know that unmet expectations leads to unhappiness, leads to anger, leads to bitterness. Do you still suffer by times from a lack of hope? true hope? Do you still wonder every now and then about your mortality, even though that you are saved? Do you still have a decided lack of a worldview and you need to be honest with each other? John 3 and 6 says this on the screen, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, before your mind spirals out of control, because the Holy Spirit may have spoken to your heart this morning, I want to remind you of something that's been made very clear for us. If we declare that we uh, that, Lord, that, that Jesus is the Lord of our life, if we believe in our heart that God the Father sent him to live and to die, he took our sins to the cross, to the grave, left him there, rose victorious to the right hand, the Bible says we are 
saved. But we still fall short of God's glorious standard in sin. And the Bible says that no one is good, not one. So we are still human in a sense. And you might think, hey, I still may be drifting a bit, and I, my, maybe my passions, and, I, and I'm still trying to find my purpose, and maybe some hope, and maybe every now and then I feel my mortality, and, and maybe I'm distracted in some ways, and I'm not supposed to be. And I thought that I got out of that when I accepted Jesus. I got out of that when I went towards the Lord. I got out of that when I heard Scripture, when I heard the voice of the Lord, and I move in that way. But now as I'm sitting here, maybe some of that stuff is still hanging on to me. If you feel that way, do not despair. Paul has a message for you in Romans 8 and 1. It's a very simple one. It reads this way. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You cannot lose your salvation even if you're struggling, even if you're true, fully not out of that old world, you will go to heaven. There is no condemnation for those who know the Lord, regardless of what anyone says to you. You must believe that. You must believe that. Maybe you didn't get completely out of your old nature, completely out of your old life. When you accepted the Lord, God placed within you everything that you need. We talk about putting it on a shelf and forgetting about it, but God's given you everything. A beautiful, this is not up on the screen here, a beautiful passage from Proverbs. It says, a plan in the heart of a man is like deep water, but the man of understanding draws it out. Or in the Hebrew, counsel in a man's heart is like deep water, but the man of understanding will draw it out. The counsel of the plan is the Hebrew word halakha, halakha. And it means everything that the Lord has taught you, all of your experiences, all of the ordinances that we're supposed to do, all the things that God has given to you is there. And sometimes it's stuck. And it says that it takes the understanding of a man to draw it out. And the only man that can draw that out for you is Yeshua ben Joseph, Jesus Christ. If you're hanging on to a little bit of this stuff of your old nature, if you're hanging on to a little bit of your old world, seek Jesus. And all of that stuff that's already within you, will come into an understanding. Next week, we're going to look at if we get out. How do we get in over here? What are the rules? Is there a secret handshake? Do I have to ring the doorbell two times and stop and bring it again? Like, what is it? What do I have to do? What do I have to change? As I've said over and over and over again to this beautiful young lady that was a receptionist at the garage I took the car to. I said, I bet you're not in church. She said, you're right. I don't go to church. I said, why don't you go to church? Because I'm not good enough to go to church. Why aren't you good enough to go to church? Because the people in the church tell me I'm not good enough mm -hmm. to go to church. She wants out of this old world, right? She wants into this new world and there are good Christians standing in the door not letting her in. And I want to talk about how do we get in? And I want to talk about us. Who should we let in? And what will happen when it's in there? And we're going to do that next Sunday. And then we're going to talk about those of us who may be hanging on for dear life, both worlds. Because we love this, and there's still kind of excitement over there, right? So we don't want to let go of some of that. And I've got some, some news for you there. I've got some suggestions. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for each and every person here today, whether they're sitting here or whether they're at home. Father, I it, it was my prayer and my hope even now, Lord, that you have spoken to each and every one of us in only a way that you can, that you've delivered a personal message to each and every one of our hearts. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for doing that. If there's something we need to know, if there's something we need to remember, Lord, bring it to our minds. 
let us go out with it that we might noodle on it, that we might contemplate, that we might uh, meditate, that we might pray about it, that we might be able to try to fully escape the place that we wanted to escape from when we first started. A blessing again upon each and every person here and those that they love, Lord. A blessing upon those who could not come here today because of their sickness or other things because we have so many that are sick. And we will thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song right now as uh, we prepare to leave. And uh, a shout. No, what was I going to say? Oh, I know. There it is. Just a closer walk with me. Just a closer walk with thee.